when I've worked with uh, artists before, specifically with the artist Jörg Schoenfeld, he won't ever let me use the word collaboration because he says a collaboration is when you work on the same thing together. So in fact what this is is a kind of joint project where you work alongside one another. And so David and I decided to refer to this, it sounds pretentious now, doesn't it, as a joint project rather than a collaboration. Okay. Um, can I just ask a, a, a question which I'm sure occurs to many people in relation to the text? I think years of literary study have made people so cautious about any biographical or autobiographical assumption, and yet there's a sort of slippage in a lot of discussions where people begin calling Neville Lister Ivan and begin calling Saul Harbard and David Goldblatt. And could you speak a little bit about that dilemma in relation to the text and the way in which you yourself conceive of that correspondence? Um, yes, well, there's, there's, that, that does happen. I have, I have been referred to as Neville in conversation once. <laughs> um, I've only met one Neville before, and he was, uh, I think, quite a nice guy. So I don't, I don't, I don't have very negative associations with his name. I could have, I could have chosen worse names for my character. Um, now there is a slippage there, and it's a slippage that um, that had to happen, I think, for me as well in writing the book. I wanted to I wanted to create some distance between my character and David Goldblatt. Because after all if this was a book about David Goldblatt, the character would be called David Goldblatt. So so by that very act of, of giving him a name of his own, um, should already tell you this is not a portrait of David. Um, Nevertheless, the, the, the book was written as a response to and in resistance to David's work. And I wanted to capture something about the kind of photography that David does and the, um, the, the kind of world he's operated in and, and also something of his character, something of his approach to photography. I think that's, that for me is the key thing. Um, I do understand though that um, I think people read the book in quite different ways. David, for instance, must surely, and we haven't spoken about this in detail, but he must surely feel that Saul Albach is a version of him. Um, and I've had many people say to me, you know, Saul Albach really is a wonderful portrait of David. Whereas I, never, I never thought of it that way. I never set out consciously to create an, a, 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 an accurate representation of David. I think he's done that himself in his own work. So for me, what, what was fruitful is to find the gap between uh, Saul Albach and David. And that goes for the works too. Now the photographs that are, that are described in the, the novel are invented photographs. But I've been told by several people that they've looked through TJ very carefully for at least one of the photographs because they're convinced that it's a David Goldberg photograph. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that the novel has told him clearly it's a sort of armor for sure. <laughs> Thank you. I just, um, if we leave aside Ivan and David for the time being, there's a particular conversation in the novel between the aesthetical convictions, obviously, of Saul Albach and those of Neville Lister. And Neville Lister grows away from the sense of being able to get to the heart of the matter with a particular kind of process of representation and eventually will choose to photograph walls rather than go behind them to see the informal settlements of um, desperate people who have found themselves in Johannesburg, the sort of process both of avoidance and a commitment to the surfaces that exclude things. I wonder if you could speak a little bit, because it's not an excessively analytical question, if you could speak a little bit to the different aesthetics of Saul Arbach and Neville Lister. Yeah, I think... Um Partly because of a generational difference, I think Saul Auerbach represents a kind of photography that's prepared to be um, um, very engaged with the subject. Now, um, so I'm going to start talking about David Goldblatt now because I know him better than Saul Auerbach. Um, I think I think David, and this, this is the kind of photography that, that that I was interested in exploring through the, the Saul Auerbach character. Um, there's a kind of photographer who has a, who has a way of approaching people and um, 
and engaging them in that exchange, in the photographic exchange, that makes them feel very much a part of, of the process. Um, not that they're required to act for the camera, in fact, on the contrary, it's, their, it's that they're not directed, they're not, they're not told what to do. And I like that, I like that in, in, a, in, in, in David's photography, and I try to capture that in Saul's photography. Um, I think this comes through in David's work. I think there's, there's a sort of um, confidence and, um, how can I put it, a kind of um, claiming of the self in the photograph on, on the part of his subjects, which one doesn't see in a lot of photography. Um, and Lister himself is a bit more like me. I'm not a, I'm, first of all, I'm not a, cam a, a camera user. I don't use a camera pra practically at all. Um, I think I once took a photograph on myself and um, I won't, I won't actually, I was going to describe what it was about, but I think I'll just leave that. <laughs> um, um, so I, I can't use a camera without feeling that I'm, in, I'm invading or, or imposing upon somebody. And I think Lister's got something of that. He's got a kind of reticence about um, going beyond the, the threshold that people establish of going beyond the surface. Um, yeah. Thank you. I just, uh, this might seem a rather oblique question, but um, I mean, your, your work is very often focused on the idea of found units of meaning in the world, or the, the way that you refer to history, or the way that you utilize language, or the way that you find words in dictionaries, and, Words often have an almost material, palpable presence in your writing. And it's almost, at times, it feels as if we're reading an example of installation art where various words and phrases are put alongside one another and develop very compelling trajectories of meaning and possibility. So I'm going to ask a, a, an oblique question, which is about the place of found materials, anecdotes or books or words in your writing and in your aesthetic. I've, I've, thought, I've thought about this, but whether I can put it into some sort of uh, logical form, I'm not sure. I think, I think that sense of a found, of found language comes out of my particular um, biography. It, it arises at the point at which I'm starting to learn to write myself. Um, some of the writers that I admired when I, when I was beginning as a writer were people like Don Bothelm. And um, I think... Those early postmodernists were very concerned with existing language and with the forms and and um, and styles and with, voc with particular vocabularies of particular registers. You know? um, Bartholm was always playing with advertising language or the language of um, publicity or the language of politics, and but I think that was that was part of the imp the, the impetus to to look at language as material from which other things could be constructed. And I think it comes out of a fascination with things like, I don't know, with Dada, with my early student years, with, with the sorts of art that, that assembled existing, existing things, existing materials. I think that's a, I mean, that was a major thrust in all 20th century art.